TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see a little warning screen just in case, man. Don't forget, we do got Patreon.com. It's where you can watch the stuff that we don't watch on YouTube, like series and movies and Premier League highlights and things of that nature. Uh, we also got Twitch.com. That's where you can catch a live stream. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. This is Jimmy the Giant, per usual. He got a lot of stuff that I like. A lot of educational stuff for me. The Evil Decline of Britain's Dystopian Estates. W Reader. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. In London, you, you probably are picturing. This video is brought to you by Square. Probably not picturing is this. The Aylesbury has long been considered one of the most notorious estates in London, a symbol of urban decay. What once started as a way of lifting the British working class out of slums has over time just descended into these crime-ridden, dilapidated areas. Two boys following me out behind me, and they went, oh, a UW car, I went, yes. They tried jumping me, so knocked, knocked them both out. Aylesbury Estate in South East London say they're living in fear after a second murder in the area within three months. Southwark Council can legally insist Beverly vacates her home. This is what i worked all my life for, to end up with a property like this. Today we're going to tell the dark truth behind Britain's dystopian estates. Living environmental conditions unmatched by anything that has existed before. Thamesmead, with its own identity, but still a lively part of London, growing from the river, the changing... The failure to provide the kind of facilities originally intended for Thamesmead has left many of those who moved here hoping for a new life both deeply disappointed and desperate to get Ain't this the dude that got chased by the, uh, the bee? Get out. In the 1800s, Britain was going through industrialization. After centuries of feudalism, the working class had now had these weird things called rights. I was just wondering if, um, possibly we, um, we'd like a pay rise? The 1834 English Poor Law, it made a very clear distinction between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. Fair enough. You know, if you're, you have no leg. That's fair. I'm not gonna lie. Deserving poor and undeserving poor. Nah, that's because the undeserving poor be taking advantage of stuff. If, you, if you're really down bad and really effed up, then okay. But some people be poor and effed up by choice. And you got to make that distinction. I get it. Talk to them. Arms. Okay, you're allowed to be poor. If you were just, you know, average Joey Schmoey and all your, fuck, all your sticks are working, how dare you not become rich? The Housing of Working Class Act of 1880, 1890. <laughs> I think the government were very perturbed about people possibly uprising against the government as they were in Russia. So what, give them good houses, keep them quiet? Keep them happy. This act and a series of others were passed where they had given councils the right and the responsibility to flatten slums, get rid of these shitty slums, and in place, build council houses. Okay. There was one place so hellishly awful that would become the very first council estate. It almost goes without saying that these slums were overcrowded and poorly maintained, hotbeds of crime, disease and alcoholism. The Old Nickel was among the worst of these slums. The Old Nickel makes Luton look like Dubai. I'm talking you're surrounded by piss and poo. This place is releasing new dis- The Old Nickel sound terrible. I ain't even gonna lie to you. That, that is a slum name. The Old Nickel. They couldn't even be called the old quarter. They a nickel? That's five cent. In America at least. These is like The rooms were just cramming in people so that landlords could charge more rent per square inch. These landlords weren't exactly incentivized to repair things. So you know if there's a 
hole in the roof and you called the landlord, he would take one look at it and say, ah, oh, that sucks. One in four babies in the old nickel died before the age of one. The council took a look at it and said, fuck it. Let's flatten the place. Let's start again. And they made the Boundary Estate. Nichols, is there a documentary on the old nickel? That sounds debaucherous. And if we look at the Boundary Estate today, you might notice it looks quite nice. That's because yeah, the yeah. architect, who was called Owen Fleming, he had this crazy idea where he believed that beauty and nice looking architecture was important. This place was great, but you see there was a problem. As the slum dwellers stared on as their homes were flattened before their eyes, awaiting the keys to their new homes, they found out that the rent was double that of the slums. And so they packed their presumably empty bags and headed over to just another nearby slum. And in moved in the more affluent, deserved working class. We were thinking in terms of a new world, uh, the returning soldiers. They got gentrified right under their noses. Deserved. That's normally how it happens, though. A decent environment, and that was really the main task. And we thought that we were, we'd been called by chance and by our place in history to create that new world. Post-World War I, there was a slow but gradual spread of social housing. In 1912, you had the Old Oak and Wormholt. This was being built under the Homes for Heroes. So basically, war veterans were promised to come back to land. That promise was a lie. And because they didn't want a revolution on their hands, they built this place and said, all right, fine. A bit later after this, you'd have the Beacon Tree Estate. And they actually built 27,000 homes here. This place was a fucking utopia. Imagine you have just come from living in a literal slum and now you have a you have grass, you have a garden in the front and the back of your house. You, you had room. I ain't never had that. I ain't never had a back. Yes, I did, but we never we didn't use it that one time because it was terrible looking, but big enough that you could like do that with your arms running water a toilet windows a boiler affordable rent however all of this was not gonna come without a few rules every house got a handbook with rules and advice among the rules they had to clean their windows once a week and when it came to lavatory systems they were told there is no need to pull the chain with a jerk. The idea of parental conservatism was an intro. That's fair. One. It was like a socialist attitude combined with conservatism. They still believed that the aristocrats were more morally superior and better than the poor, but they had a responsibility to raise the poor up, you know, offer them a hand. Baz, put down the cigarettes and pick up a croquet stick. The people that moved into the Beacon Tree estate were given a handbook of rules. You couldn't just have a disused caravan in your driveway with like a broken washing machine out there. The idea right, and that be the problem. I, I feel this though. That be the problem. I said this in one of these videos that I was watching about something. I forgot a documentary or something. The problem is you give certain people things and they treat it like they still got nothing. Hey, the idea of having standards. It wasn't which a messes it up for everybody. Terrible one, it was fair. But they, they often went a bit too far, you know. There was definitely this kind of moral superiority. It led to things like they wouldn't make a pub in this area. They had to be sober in order to live in this property. But regardless of a few less beers with the boys, this was a ma like Australia do. massive upgrade from living in a slum. I mean, come on. But most of all, Beckentree gave thousands and thousands and thousands of people from the East End and beyond a home. And I think for that alone, we should salute it. However, slowly, things would begin to change. Before we go any further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to Square. Massive shout out for Jimmy the Giant and Squarespace's partnership. Pay the bills. Squarespace for... By the 1930s, Britain's pimp my slum scheme was going pretty well. <laughs> hey, pimp my slums. 
Who's the host? Brit British government. But then it got infected by a new dope strain of architecture called modernism. All right, we did this in the Milton Keynes video. I'm not going to do it again, but we can actually see that original modernism wasn't that bad. When we look at St. Andrew's Garden in Liverpool. The modern and skillfully executed housing provision for the wage earners of Liverpool. Until you start to cut corners. Which instead of taking influence from British architecture, nice. looked to Europe with the Horseshoe Estate Brits in Berlin. This building, okay, it's not the most beautiful, but it had brick, it had different colors, different materials, slope roofs. It wasn't just gray concrete or like a glass fish bowl. And it was built well, like it stands here today in good condition and it's still used. And as I keep saying, if you were in a slum beforehand, you're not going to start questioning, oh, I'm not sure on the architectural decisions of this place. You're going to say, give me the fucking keys. We had to take a quick break from building council houses in 1939 to 1945 because Britain was busy saving the world. But following the war, these soldiers came back to a country where nearly half a million of the homes had been destroyed by bombs. And so the boys had to quickly hop on the tools and just start throwing up some buildings. In 1946, we got Churchill Gardens. And you might take a look at this and think, Jesus Christ, what the hell happened? We went in to do it quick. Insane building. It was like a Fortnite World Cup final. And we weren't just creating new houses. We were now creating new entire towns. And all of this was built off of these crazy radical ideas of urban planning by people like Le Cabousier and Adolf Luz. To think about brutalism is to think about concrete. Brutalism. All right, brutalism. So brutalism was like a reaction to modernism. Where Not gonna lie. Is Jimmy the Giant, is he... In his former life or before YouTube, or was he a teacher? Was he planning to be a lecturer? Or, like, he's a really, I'm not going to lie. I don't know. I can't fact check any of this. Y'all would have to tell me, but it, I feel like he's, he makes learning fun. If I had a teacher like Jimmy the Giant in high school, who knows? I might have changed the world. You feel me? Whereby, from what I understand, Le Cabousier, as he got older, looked back at his original modernist buildings and said, I, I need to start making buildings that make you feel something. And so he created Brutalism, which was just raw, rough, concrete. And yeah, they made you feel something. Depressed. This is Dennis Lasdon's National Theatre, completed in 1976. Prince Charles thought it looked like a nuclear power station. It does. What Charles meant was that it was an industrial looking building, something that was rather bleak and uncompromising, something that didn't look like a theater. But that was the point. <laughs> I don't know who de That's shite. designs them. I don't know who they designed them for, or if they think that we feel or think any differently than they do. There must be reasons why these architects uh, build these flats in this design and this high. To save space and cut costs put a bunch of units next to each other you build it on concrete and straight bricks with no shape with no dimensions with no character and you could fit more units in it hard barrack looking way because I'm sure they couldn't possibly like the um, structure and the outlook of them themselves I don't think there was an awful lot of thought put into it if they would have only consulted ordinary people who have to live in these places, what what we would like. Many of the modernists are. Re they don't care. Reaction of the horrors of World War One and World War Two, where they specifically wanted to depart from European tradition, and so within this movement, an, a mood of negativity towards the past and an optimism towards the future group. But look, all that kind of artsy fartsy talk aside, ultimately we made them because they're cheap as chips to produce. If all goes according to plan, by the middle of the 1980s, this village will have become a part of the largest new town ever built in Britain. I think it's ridiculous. This is a good farming ground. Why don't they go somewhere else where there isn't no farming ground not far away? The British people of the 50s and 60s were starting to get a little bit pissed that they were building entire towns in their garden. And so there was a push to come up with newer ways of creating houses but not encroaching on green space. And so in Essex Harlow, a brand new building was made that would change everything. 
The Lawn. This building marked the beginning of the high-rise gold rush. Post-war, though, the real trend was to... So that was the problem. But now we're moving away from this high-rise again and putting it back to, like, the other way before. Which is better, safer. Replace slums and bond houses with high-density flats. By 1975, 440,000 new high-rise apartment flats had been created. And that's because the government was subsidizing every single extra floor to a building. So the incentive was built into the sky. And so this led us to some absolute beauties like Robin Hood Estates. It should be blown up. Replacing the point. That is bad. <laughs> this is terrible. Go back. Beauties like Robin Hood. Oh my god. Like, I understood the concept when we were talking about it early, put as many units next to each other, but this is terrible. Like, golly. You no space, no privacy. I bet you the walls are paper thin. If you're knocking something down, the neighbors know my name. This is crazy. Hood Estates. It should be blown up. Play, play the point. Like 15, 20 years ago, it was voted by Nationwide as the worst design block in England. Churchill Gardens, Chalk Hill Estate. Chalk Hill's been a problem since it was built in 1966. One of the biggest estates in London, it's always suffered more than its fair share of hooliganism, vandalism and muggings. Haygate Estate. Look, when we look at them now, they look awful. I feel like the UK has way more like estate council type buildings, pro project type buildings than... Chicago. They took a lot of them down in Chicago, but they still are like what y'all would call affordable housing. We call it Section 8, like low-income housing, but yeah, this is bad. They completely run down, look terrible, but bearing in mind the people that moved into this a week prior were living in a slum having rats nibbling at their toes. Now they had fridge freezers, they had parks, they were safe, they weren't living in a biohazard anymore. This era post-war gave the working class a massive step up out of poverty. In 1979, 42% of British people lived in council houses. These estates, when they were first built, were loved. People loved them. There was a sense of community there. You know, they would look out for one another and there was a pride in where they came from. He'd never move off here. He always said, no, we've got everything. Hot water, eating. What more can a working man want? As far as that close proximity to living is concerned, in general, I think it's an example to the country. So what the fuck happened? Among the five and a half thousand people on the Ferrier estate at Kidbrook are 20 children living in a twilight world in the underground car parks. Youth workers discovered them sleeping rough, most of them abandoned by their families. The UK began as a small group of teenagers writing graffiti. They've now progressed to street robbery and even more violent offences. Yeah, there's been stabbings, people being sent away for stabbings down New Malden High Street. On the I seen this documentary. We did this reaction. Aylesbury Estate in South East London say they're living in fear after a second... That car park thing, we did a documentary. ...murder in the area within three months. A friend is dead, yeah, and this is what we're doing to support him, yeah? Look what they're doing. Look, seen this no, 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 There's been a lot of knife crime. We've had three murders in the last kind of couple of weeks. So how many people have you? Originally, council housing was not associated in any way with crime. And in fact, I read this really good study that I'll link below that talks about the decline in social housing and how they became more criminal over time. And it all seems to point to a very pivotal time of change, which was the 70s. The 70s in Britain was a mad one. It was, it was a time of high unemployment. It was mass inflation, social unrest. There were power outages happening. And so this is the backdrop of the 70s. And I was generally thinking that people start getting money and people start not having money the separation of money and non-money really grew crime is is going up it's not looking good and there is one law that is often pointed to as the start of the downfall of social housing and that was the 1977 housing homeless persons act what this did was change social housing from being like a carrot on the stick for the motivated working class to now being a right for the most vulnerable people of society and the homeless became the priority and this idea of housing based on need was open to all sorts of interpretation so at one point britain actually put the their people first the homeless first
leave it to some of these documentary and some of these street interviews, this never happened. And abuse. Now look, it, this all sounds well and good. It sounds good to look after the homeless people, of course. But it did lead to some problems. <laughs> If we kind of think about the incentive structure that, that is in play here, beforehand it was effectively a way of motivating the working class to work hard. They would get a property, they would then have pride in that property because they earned it, they deserved it, and they would take care of it and look after it. But I think the more ideological side of the Labour MPs of that time, who funnily enough were not the ones living in council estates, they saw this incentive structure as discriminatory. Why should only the good working class get a nice house? <laughs> what if good doesn't even exist, bro? I, I, I got my stance on this. Some people don't deserve stuff. Because they they're just inherently treated like it's nothing still. And one, all it takes is one person to make start treating something bogus. And then the next person will be like, man, well, I'm going to go the extra mile and clean up and do this when they ain't doing it. That's all it takes, buddy. People say it's, a, it's the kids that break everything. It's the kids that make a mess. But I tell you, it's not. When I first moved here, every day for three weeks I cleaned out the chutes, I cleaned out everything. Not five minutes later, some dirty person will come along and drop yeah. pill, yeah. everything. Dirty STs, everything you can think of on the floor. It's not the kids. I told you, all it takes is one person. Why am I going to continue to keep it clean? <clears throat> It's some of the peoples. They come from slums and they're gonna make this a slum. So just imagine this whole community of similarly minded working class people motivated. They work in the same factories. They send their kids to the same school. They have a tight knit community. But now you could just jump to the front of the queue of the housing list if you were homeless, unemployed. Those people could be the types of people that have serious mental health conditions, drug addiction problems, etc. But instead of making specific programs to take care of the homeless of society, you know, help them, train them to get into jobs, etc. But now they were just being put into these communities and what's more is prioritised over working class people. And this started to create a bitter feeling in the general public. Worse still, Thamesmead became a dumping. Once again, like I'm going to say, so... Leave it to some of these people getting interviewed, the homeless on the street. Not all of them. This never happened. I ain't never heard of this act. I've never heard of it. It's the first time. But see, the government probably went back on it because it was being mistreated. Who knows? I'm just reading in between the lines. Let me know in the comments how you feel. ...ground for poor or difficult families. Today, two out of three are on housing benefit. Half the adults are unemployed. Thamesmead did become a dumping ground. That's half its problem. They basically just threw the doors open for the first five or six years um, just to get anyone onto Thamesmead. But as the years went on, people saw Thamesmead more as a prison and began to resent the areas and lost interest in all facilities and stopped trying. I've got a quote here from 1977 of Sir Robin Wales, who is the mayor of Newham in East London. He says that if you walk in and say, I'm homeless, you get a greater priority than if you walk in and say, I've managed to do something for myself, but I'm still looking for a council property. In 1979, 57,200 people said they were homeless, and this peaked at 151,720 by 1991. And so just bear all of this in mind and consider that in the 70s as well, there was a general rise in crime, in alcoholism. It's like they incentivize being broke. Drug use. And all of this was likely happening in this era as a reaction to the economic instabilities, plus the cuts to social housing and benefits that were already starting to happen in the 70s, plus this rise in low quality high rise flats where tons of them had been poorly built and there was disasters and some of them were demolished. In Birkenhead, these two blocks have lasted just 18 years. Now they're going to be demolished because they're literally rotten. And because of the economic climate, the councils had to cut funding to maintain these areas, keep them looking nice. And so for the council house, it wasn't looking very good. And then it would receive its final killing blow in 1979. Now that the election is over, may we get together and strive to serve and strengthen the country of which we're so proud to be a part. Big, 
Big Mama Thatch came in in 1979 to, you know, fix all of England's problems. But it would be the Housing this Act of 1980 her. that would... This why, yeah, I hate her. Margaret Thatcher ruined it for the for the government handing it out to their own homelesses. Introduced the idea of right to buy. Through a policy of purchasing council houses by their tenants, a policy which was bitterly opposed by the Labour Party, a policy from which many, many people have profited and are very grateful for that. It basically gave people who lived in council houses the opportunity for the first time in their lives where they could actually buy the property off of the council. And what's more, it was at a massively reduced rate. This sounded very good. You know, some people look down on you, you know. Say, oh, you live in a council house and um, that's not good. But uh, when you own your own property, you do go up in the world a little bit. Working class people now had an opportunity to get on the housing ladder. Only 55% of the population in the 1980s owned their own home, but by 1987, now 64% did. These council houses were selling to the private individuals like hotcakes. But let's jump forward a lot of years to 2015 and 2016, where home ownership has declined from its high in 2003 of 70.9% back down to 62.5%, the lowest level since 1985. So, you know, if this was intended to bring Baz and Stacy up from the working class into the home owning middle class, then where did all these houses go? Baz and Stace saw that their house prices had rised amazingly. It was great. And so they obviously sold their house to go live in the Cotswold and live out the Jeremy Clarkson dream. Don't get me wrong. I completely understand it. I would do 100% the same thing. But you have to start wondering who bought these houses? Well, it turns out that it's mainly massive wealthy investment firms who buy the house off of this middle class and then rent it back to the working class. If we want to know what economies without property owning middle classes look like, it's really easy to see that because we, the world is full of them. You can go to Brazil, you can go to South Africa, you can go to Russia, you can go to India and you can see what economies look like when you do not have a property owning middle class. Charles Goh, who was the son of Miss Thatcher's housing minister, Ian Goh, he had bought 40 of the 120 council flats in one social housing project called Roehampton. So really what I'm trying to fucking illustrate in a smart way is these social houses- Only certain people should have been able to buy them and not in bulk like that. They were funded by the taxpayer. Now they made it a, a, a business to create even more separation and money. So, you know, taxes that we all paid to build houses to help the working class, which it did for a short period of time. But it ended up, if you fast forward to the end of the movie, they just landed in the hands of the ultra wealthy and shrunk the homeowning middle class. If you don't have a middle class society, you have a, a rich and poor society. And if you don't have a middle class society, you don't need middle class housing. What you need is rich housing and poor housing. And increasingly, that is what we will see. And so, see, I'm smart. Well, I be trying to tell y'all, like, I, I, I'm, I'm an always good at processing information as it comes. And that's what I just said. It just the wealth gap just increased. That's it. <laughs> For the social housing that did remain in the hands of the council. Yeah, it definitely didn't, it didn't age well. In this study, it shows that the buildings that were built with better quality, with more traditional architecture, they, surprisingly, turned out to be the most popular and more people bought them. But if you were unfortunately put into one of them thrown up shitty high rises, no one really wanted to buy them. And so this led to a phenomena, this general trend that started to happen to the social fabric of council houses that is known as residualization. Tower blocks soared, but few predicted the squalor of so-called sink estates. Its graffiti-covered walls, its dark alleyways, its stinking staircases, today are monuments to the decline it suffered since then. In the same study, it notes that not all council estates were seen as equally good. If the council thought that you were maybe one of the less deserving of the people wanting to get a council house, they would often be put into the shitter estates, creating these estates full of what we could call naughty Nigels. And so along with this change to social- That's gotta be prejudice, of, that's gotta be like discrimination. Social credit that now incentivized people to be homeless, not to work. You'd even get more money for the more kids you had. If you weren't married, you'd get more money. Some people even point to the introduction of school league tables in 1992. Which, what did that do? It promoted single family housing. 
and in turn, there's a result for every action. So, all these single, all the promotion of single parent, single family households, no dads in the house. Now look what you got: the high crime rate, high dropout, high prison, overpopulated prisons, leading to a rise in kids should really show you where how important the dad is in the home to the introduction of school league tables in 1992 leading to a rise in kids being expelled from school in order to make it look like your school's performance was better these kids who are probably you know maybe they struggled in school etc they would often be now just living on the, the council estate kids you know kick it over bins and graffiti because they have nothing to do all day and it's believed that this is actually what created the underclass that we later now call chavs or really we call roadmen the gang in and around the local shops intimidates many of the residents i don't go around there it's 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 not safe I'm trying to tell you we can all point to the government for this whatever they did for some money it turned out bad for human for mankind to go around there the, the kids hang around outside the pub and they aggravate other people that go around there. They deliberately cause upset around there. Just imagine you're like, you know, you're a hard-working class bloke. You're happy to spend all day earning your crust. Get home, have a beer, give your missus a kiss, go to bed, do it all again. You probably don't want to live next door to crazy Steve's who's smoking bifters out the window listening to 50 Cent at 3pm on a Wednesday. Hey, bruv, shut your mouth. Sorry, mate, sorry. This process moved the more working class people out of these estates and so that left all of the naughty kids to be put into one classroom together with very little assistance to try and raise them out into jobs etc and surprisingly that created problems. This video describes the life of a gang which associates itself with the estate. Teenagers wrapping promises of violence towards rival groups in other areas. It's been sold. The government don't take no accountability though, man. <laughs> it's the opportunity of a lifetime, the chance for families from humble beginnings to get themselves a secure footing on the London property ladder. But actually, the right to buy your council home may not be such a great deal. Hard. I actually worked two jobs to earn the money wow. to put the deposit down. I literally worked from nine till five and then six until midnight. And I was really happy that I was able to buy my own home. But five years ago, Beverly received a letter from Southwark Council revealing that all she had worked for, her home, was going to be bulldozed. I'm going to be moved out due to my, my local council regenerating the estate and basically taking our homes under compulsory purchase. Compulsory purchase is a medieval law that was designed to give the Crown the right to flatten your house if they needed to build a railway or like an army yes, barracks. Sir. So under compulsory purchase, the, the council can knock on your door, say, look mate, we need your house, here's 20 pounds, and you have to get the fuck out. I'm exaggerating, but they could literally offer half the market value, it seemed, because they had to give you a price that they deemed was fair. And it led to like this ma- That they deemed is crazy. Mafioso extortion that is completely legal and there are many examples of this but we'll focus on one in particular the Haygate estate Residents who were moved off the Haygate estate in South London under a huge regeneration scheme have claimed they weren't offered enough money to buy another home locally Haygate was a shithole I know that because I used to go there to do parkour and genuinely I was scared for my life. But they were good jumps, so you know, sometimes you just have to risk it. From the late 90s to the early... <laughs> was that actual footage of you doing parkour? 2000s, there was plans to redevelop this place. And although most of it was now boarded up and completely derelict, there were still some people who remained. And for the council, that was inconvenient. And so they had to evict them. But in order to evict them, they had to buy their property. Some of the offers for the property in London were 80,000 pounds. Bear in mind, in the 2000s, a property the similar size in the similar area would have been worth about 300,000 pounds. So if the council is kicking you out of your house and giving you 80,000 pounds, where do you go? You can't- You can only go rent if you, <laughs> and you'll run out of money eventually.
You can't now move down the road. You have to leave London, your community where you grew up. Where back in the 80s, you were promised this was a fantastic investment, my friend. <laughs> Buy the place. Only to find years later, the place is worth nothing. And now we're going to flatten it, make luxury apartments that are going to be sold from the lowest price of £550,000. Thank you very much. But it turned out in 2017 that 100% of the flats that were sold at the time were sold to private investment firms. But look, surely at the end of the day, this means more money in the council's pocket that they can give to people and help. Huh. Right. Southwark Council sold this land to a private development firm from Australia called Landlease for a whopping total of 50 million pounds. After having spent 44 million pounds on emptying it, where it's predicted for land lease, it has a gross development value of 990 million pounds. There's actually other reports out there that claim that Southwark Estate sold the, the land at a loss. And it all just seems a bit fishy to me. You had a right to buy, but the money that, that was taken from what you bought with was gonna build other houses, other council houses. That's right, yeah. Which never happened. It's sad to see it, but social housing really fell from grace. And there's no more vivid a moment. It really did, and I didn't know half of the stuff that he talked about in this, and I'm glad I watched it because now I know. And I'm pretty sure maybe a lot of younger people don't know some of this stuff either. Then on the 14th of June 2017, where a fire broke out on a high-rise flat called Grenfell right. Towers. R.I.P. to everybody who lost their life in that a tragic event. And in its glory days, in that period, Britain experienced the biggest economic boom it had ever seen up until that point. Raising people out of slums to working class and then to middle class, if only for a brief moment. And to me, I can't help but see it. that The country just opted for short term profit. We sold. Yeah, they got greedy. Greed is crazy. The love of money is the root of all evil the family silver and instead of reinvesting the money into the working class to raise everyone's standard of living we have what we have now and i'm telling you britain is getting depressing i don't think there's anyone these days that can deny the obvious evidence that there is a shrinking middle class that towns are dying and places just look kind of shit here now as the rich get richer they buy more assets from the middle class middle class gets poorer which means that the rate of inequality increasing increases more at the end of the day, man, stop doing stuff for money. All money ain't good money. The middle class has less assets and the rich has more assets. So we know things will get worse. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the speed at which life is getting worse now, people are not going to accept it. It's sad to see, and I hope that we fix it. I want to know your stories around council housing and your thoughts, so comment below. If you want a further discussion on this topic, come join us on our Discord. I'll Excellent watch. This is sensational. Every time I watch a video from him, and I don't know why y'all be saying stuff about him in the comments. Oh, you can't show. I mean, I, maybe, but still, it's still educational for me, somebody on America looking from the outside in. Leave a like, comment, I'm gone.